1515 was when uh, his, he constructed two hemispheres of the northern and southern celestial hemispheres. And their maps, because he put the constellations and the stars, mainly the stars, in a primitive radial grid. He had constellations, but it was the star locations that were in the grid. He used a polar stereographic projection and an external orientation, like on a globe, like the Farnese Atlas I showed you earlier. And here it is, the Northern Hemisphere map from uh, Durr. This, uh, this is borrowed from my uh, good friend who sadly passed away, uh, Robert Gordon. Uh, he lent me this picture and a few of the others. Here is the map, and you can see it's a map because you see along the rim, the degrees of latitude, 360 of them, and you can tell where the, um, the, the location, say, of this, this star right here is based on where it is in, in this uh, grid uh, and latitude. And the longitude is you go from here to here, 90 degrees. So you go whatever percentage it is on your straight edge. It looks about almost half. So you can tell what degree of longitude it is, uh, latitude it is as well as the degrees of longitude along the periphery. So when I'm with a group and let's live, I always like to ask them and have them raise their hands. Is this a geocentric or an external projection? Well, I'll have to tell you that because of the, uh, uh, the Zoom uh, format. If you look at the periphery, you see the constellations of the Zodiac. Here's Leo the lion, here's Gemini and so on. So you know 90 degrees away is the Northern ecliptic pole, not the, uh, the equatorial pole. And furthermore, because the question mark of Leo is facing the way it is in a real question mark, and because the bowl of the Big Dipper, the handle is to the right of the bowl, you know that this is an external projection. This is a projection that you would see of a map that's like in a marble statue, like the one I showed you earlier from um, our friend Farnese Atlas. The first um, printed star atlas was done in 1540 by Italian cleric and polymath Alessandro Piccolomini of the fa famous Piccolomini family. Uh, this is not the one, by the way, who was, became Pope. This was a different Piccolomini. But he did the star atlas that showed accurately plotted constellation stars uh, and in plates in his book, De La Stella Fizzi. And here you see an example of that. Um, you don't see a grid system, a, a large grid system. What you see is the constellation, in this case, the Small Dipper, and here the Big Dipper on the right. Uh, but you can tell it's a map because you see the degrees separating the different stars on this ruler down here below. So you can tell how far each of the stars is from each other. And you can tell about the magnitude of the stars by the complexity of the diagram that's, that represents them. So this is the first star atlas that has a series of plates representing all the constellations and showing how they're oriented. The golden age of what I call imaged celestial cartography, that is, celestial maps where you have images of the constellations really was from the 1600s to the 1800s. And there are four people, especially that were very influential during this period that a lot of people borrowed from. And I wanna highlight them first. Uh, the first of these was Johann Bayer. Uh, they're all Johans, by the way, I guess you have to be named John to be a famous cartographer in this era. Uh, the Augsburg lawyer, he wasn't a professional. No one was a professional astronomer in those days. He came up with Uranometria, his famous star a celestial atlas in 1603. He plotted the stars in a grid system with a geocentric trapezoidal projection. He also included 12 new southern constellations that, that were the product of explorers, European explorers. I mean, the Aborigines had their own Southern constellations, but the, the uh, European explorers went down into the Southern realms and came back with inventions of new constellations. And these were included in Bayer's uh, famous Atlas. 2000 stars and the brightness was indicated by Greek letters with alpha being the brightest. Here you see the constellation of Bootes from one of Bodhi's plates. And you see along the side degrees of latitude and longitude. Uh, and you see the lines representing them. Uh, I mentioned Arcturus. Here's the famous, the brightest star, Alpha uh, in Bootes, which is the star of Arcturus. So is this a geocentric representation or, or an external? Well, the way you can tell, this is the 
This is the handle of the Big Dipper on the right. Uh, the Big Dipper goes this way and then off screen to the right is the bowl. So the handle is to the left of the bowl. So this is a geocentric orientation. If you were to look up at the heavens tonight and you'll see the Big Dipper, uh, then you follow the arc of the Big Dipper's handle to Arcturus. As a famous mnemonic of uh, amateur astronomers learn, the arc of the Big Dipper to Arcturus will center you on booties and to the left of it. So this is a geocentric representation. The second of my big four is Johannes Hevelius, a Polish brewer and astronomer, very wealthy, came from a famous uh, uh, brewing company in Poland. Uh, he's noted, but his, really, his real love was astronomy. So he had a uh, big astronomical uh, enterprise uh, uh, with telescopes. He also had uh, sextants and, and a number of ways of looking at star positions. Uh, and he came up with selenographia, the first true lunar atlas uh, in 1647, and uranographia, a very, very well done uh, star atlas in 1687, the year of his death is when it came out. Avelius is old fashioned though. He felt that the telescopes, these newfangled telescopes were not as accurate because of the lenses and the blurriness that, that some of the original telescopes had in the 1600s. And, and they weren't as good as the naked eye. So he could use a lot of sextants and a lot of um, uh, quadrants to position the stars in his atlas and put them in the heavens using the naked eye. He also had 11 additional constellations that he invented. Uh, and a catalog of 1,500 stars uh, as well in his famous atlas. This is a, uh, an image of, uh, from Selenographia, 1647 edition of the moon. And you can see he has features on the moon that are represented. And he had a quite a, an elaborate system of the different craters and different, um, uh, different um, uh, areas on the, the lunar surface. This is from his star atlas, uh, also of booties. Uh, very well done. Again, you see the degrees of latitude and longitude, even tells you here longitude and latitude uh, along the periphery with the lines of latitude and longitude, so you could place the stars. And uh, the orientation is the opposite of the one I showed you earlier, it's external. How do I know? Here's Ursa Major, the arc, remember the arc to Arcturus, here's the Arcturus, and here's the handle of the Big Dipper, and the bowl is to the left. So this means it's you're outside of the celestial sphere looking back like you're looking at the Farnese Atlas. John Flamsteed was one of the first of the professional astronomers. He was appointed Astronomer Royale of England uh, in a new observatory. And his job was to catalog the stars very accurately so that the British uh, sailors could, could determine uh, celestial longitude big problem in those days, uh, the, the ships. They could tell latitude because of the, how high the pole star was above the horizon, but longitude was a problem. So an accurate catalog was necessary. So he cataloged and it came out posthumously by his wife and his um, assistants in 1725, where he had a celestial catalog saying the degrees of latitude and longitude of 3000 stars and his atlas, Atlas Celestis in 1729, uh, came out a few years later, uh, oriented to both the equatorial and ecliptic coordinates. He had a very detailed grid system, very accurate star placement, and he used a geocentric uh, projection. Uh, his atlas was, the plates were very large, not very handy at the telescope. So Fortin in France came out with a version using the same plates, but smaller versions, Atlas Celestis to Flamsteed in 1776. And here we go is a map uh, from Flamsteed's Atlas of Monoceros in the middle. And you see going across the celestial equator. So that's oriented to the celestial equator and the lines of latitude and longitude up and down and going parallel are the uh, lines of, that were oriented towards this with a zero point of, of uh, latitude being this equator. So here you go, when you go up to the Canis Minor, it's the positive direction, and you go down to Canis Major, it's a negative direction. But because some people were still using the equatorial system overlaid upon the major lines 
were the lines of the celestial equator. And you see in fainter lines going 23 and a half degrees off center to the equator were the lines of celestial longitude and latitude that ended up going to the equatorial pole. So he had both equatorial and, uh, and uh, ecliptic uh, systems shown in his maps. If you don't believe me, this is a nice view of the North Pole. This is actually from one of Fortin's pictures. And you see the two poles represented on this map. Uh, you see uh, here the, um, the, uh, the, the ecliptic pole right here where the centered around Draco. And you see the other pole, uh, uh, the equatorial pole here, the tail of the Big Dipper, of uh, the Little Dipper uh, located here. And you see the lines going of the uh, oriented towards the equatorial pole coming in here and the other pole here. So basically the two poles are represented in this Northern view uh, on the same map. It gets a little complicated, uh, but he felt the need to show them both in his atlas. Finally, Johann Bode, the last of my big four, the director of the Berlin Observatory produced several star atlases, including a version of Fortin's atlas. Uh, and this is real great uh, atlas and kind of closing out this period, Uranographia, 1801, the largest atlas ever made, had over 17,000 stars plotted in a grid system, 100 plus constellations. He invented many new constellations uh, along the way. The nice thing if you do an atlas is you get to put anything you want in your atlas. And if you want to, 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 to um, uh, reward a patron who supports your observatory, you can add a constellation in any space where there's no constellation. He used the conic projection and a geocentric orientation. And here is a, a, a view of uh, one of the plates. Uh, this is a kind of a curious view because it shows uh, the vernal equinox where the days and the nights are the same. By the way, when I talk about these, these orientations, it's where the sun is, not where the stars are. So the vernal equinox, these are hiding the constellations uh, in the bright sunlight. That, you, that you're seeing here. At night, the, uh, you'd see other constellations that are, because, that, are, that are located because it was where the sun was located in the sky, not, not where the night sky was. It indicated the constellations that were shown. So here you see the equatorial line, zero latitude, and crossing at 23 and a half degrees, the ecliptic line. And if you follow the ecliptic line here, you find the zodiac constellations. Where they cross in the springtime in the heavens is the first point of Aries. This is zero latitude, zero longitude in both systems. So if you go to the right, you start adding degrees uh, and either of these, uh, either of these lines uh, from the zero point. And over here, you can see, uh, well, you can't see, I'll show you a blow up and you'll see better. Aries, uh, which astrologically was considered the zero latitude, zero longitude uh, line. Uh, here's a blow up and here is Aries, the ram. And that's the first point of Aries that in Greek times was where these lines crossed. But now they're crossing somewhere else. Why? The earth pivots on its axis. Seven, you know, uh, it takes uh, 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 thousands of years to go around once. And as it does, these the heavens look like they're precessing. They tend to move. And so the point where the two lines cross will shift. So by the time in 1801, where uh, when he did this map, the crossing point wasn't up here where Aries, it was located here near Pisces. Some of you have heard the song, The Age of Aquarius, The Age of Aquarius. Well, we're heading for that because very soon these lines will be crossing in the constellation of Aquarius uh, as the earth continues to spin and pivot like a top around his axis. Uh, fun constellation. Here's one up here in honor of Frederick the Great, who was a patron of the Bodhi's Observatory. So he threw a constellation honoring him. And a fun constellation of uh, a hot air balloon in honor of the Montgolfier brothers. Hot air ballooning was very popular in France in the late 1700s is all the rage. And so Bode thought, well, you know, I have a few, a little space here. I'm gonna invent a constellation to honor hot air ballooning. And so he did. And there is the famous constellation, um, Globus uh, Aristaticus, which is in honor of the Montgolfier brothers. A few others I'll go through quickly. 
Julius Schiller, contemporary of Bayer's, um, uh, Augsburg lawyer also wanted to Christianize the heavens. And so he created a, a set of constellations of Christian themes, not pagan themes uh, like the Greeks had. Uh, the Northern constellations were from the New Testament, the Southern from the Old Testament, and the Zodiac constellations were the 12 apostles. And here's booties. I showed you booties before with the Big Dipper on the left. So, it's a, so you know the external projection. And instead of seeing booties, the herdsman, you see the St. Sylvester. Uh, uh, located here, and the Arcturus, follow the Arc, the Arcturus is located down here, but you see a Christianized uh, uh, saint located instead of uh, a pagan. Uh, Solarius, Andreas Solarius, not much is known about him. Uh, he's a rector at Latin schools in The Hague. He came up with a beautiful star atlas in 1660, Harmonia Macrocosmica, and the reason I'm showing this, it, it was fairly accurate. It was very nice. But if, you, if you're a collector, the most expensive star maps you can buy are from Solarius. Why? Because they were done in the Baroque era. They had pudi, they had clouds. They're gorgeous, as you can see in this representation of uh, his, um, one of his maps of the hemisphere. Uh, there you see the angels and the pudi, and you have, you have a, a beautiful uh, uh, flags up here. Uh, banders. Um, and these Solarius maps are very popular because they're in boardrooms of uh, businessmen and women who like to show off that, that they're kind of uh, important scholars. Uh, and also um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the beauty of these, of these are very, make them quite desirable with decorators. And so these are the prices up. These maps, if you bought one of these, probably in the several thousand dollars to buy one of these prints. Cornelli, you know Cornelli, some of you, as a famous globe maker, uh, but also in some of his books, he had gores for his globes. And this is an example of one of Cornelli's gores uh, from one of his books, um, Libro del, Go del uh, Globi, uh, done in 1693. And uh, these are also collectible by map collectors because as the gores, they also have degrees of latitude and longitude. You put these together, a uh, series in the Southern hemisphere, a series in the Northern, and you paste them on to a sphere uh, made out of paper mache and you've got yourself a celestial globe. Doppelmayr did a number of maps. He was a German mathematician and cartographer and in conjunction with Johann Hohmann produced many fine celestial maps. Uh, 1742, he did an atlas, and this is an example of one of the doppelmayr Homan uh, maps that came out that was done in 1742. And finally, I'll mention briefly John Beavis, a London doctor. Uh, very, uh, his, his maps are very famous, are very popular in London because uh, uh, he's, London, he's, he's English, but also uh, he did a lot of famous things, even as a doctor. Uh, he recorded the Crab Nebula, the first European to do so, and he recorded one planet occulting, passing over another planet in 1737, Venus going over Mercury. Uh, it's the first sighting ever by the naked eye, uh, well, telescopically, uh, without it being in a photograph, which we see nowadays. But he planned a great star atlas. He did a lot of plates. He got some money together. But sadly, Neil, who was a publisher, had a fire and all the plates were destroyed. So after he published a few of these plates that are gorgeous, as you can see here, uh, the, uh, he never really put them all together into an atlas, although some collectors uh, have put th some of these together to form an atlas. And you can buy these pieces here and there, uh, if you will. This is a nice, interesting illustration of uh, the only zo the zodiac comes from the Greek word zoos, which means animal. Eleven of the zodiac constellations are animals, but one that's not is this one here. It's Libra, the scales. Happens to be my birth sign, so I enjoy this particular image. Uh, and you see the constellation of Libra, and here's the grid system which is the ecliptic. This is the ecliptic line because it's a zodiac constellation. And this is the path of the sun and the planets going through the heavens, plus or minus eight degrees, and the moon as well. Uh, and then here you see the, to, to the Reverend Dean of Christ Church that provides some money to help pay for the plate. Star atlases with images, though, started to disappear as telescopes allowed for fainter and fainter stars to be observed, and photographs allowed 
the, the uh, nebula and real faint stars to be seen. So the, the constellation images were clutter uh, and they basically got in the way of star maps. Uh, the eye of somebody in a constellation, was it an eye or was it a, a new nova? So uh, constellations became less and less popular. In addition, the International Astronomical Union in 1922, uh, reflecting on things such as Boda's map, said, you know, we got too many constellations and they trimmed them down to 88 official constellations by uh, decree, international decree. Uh, and they divided the sky, not by the constellation images, but by areas of the sky. So the, currently today, there are 88 areas of the sky that are contiguous, uh, named for the constellations, but representing the whole sky. And here's a, a modern star map that you see um, the, from the 1981 Tyrion Sky Atlas. And here you see latitude and longitude uh, and sub-degrees. But you also see here's Orion, the belt of Orion, and here's this line rectilinearly represents the area of the sky that's Orion, and it butts up against Canis uh, Major down here. And so every area of the sky has uh, a space that represents that constellation area. So the constellations are gone, but for one thing, and I'll conclude with a couple words about pictorial maps. Pictorial maps were popular in the 1900s. They focused more on artistry than accuracy. And the idea was to appeal to emotion more than cognition. So they're not accurate maps. They're more illustrations with humorous satirical material, landmarks and scale variations, a lot of text variation to get you to be emotionally linked to the map. And so a lot of, uh, of pictorial maps, uh, they are collectible now, uh, look like this. Marvelous Marin, this is Marin County. And you see it's a map of Marin County. It's got the free highways and freeways, but it's got large figures. It shows you, uh, here's a Mount Tamalpais and you got a guy climbing Mount Tamalpais. You have a couple looking at the sites down here. You see a boat on the left where Drake's Bay is. You see San Francisco on the bottom. You see a lot of images, not to scale, the idea is not to be accurate, but to say, hey, you can do a lot of things. You can ride horses, you can mountain climb, come to Marin and come visit us. And needless to say, this is from a promotional leaflet that shows the highlights of Marin County circa 1958. And it's a pictorial. Here's a celestial pictorial map uh, advertising Air France. The idea is you see down below here uh, a depiction of the routes of Air France uh, and a plane on the earth, but surrounding it are this beautiful representation of the constellations to say, hey, you fly Air France, you're part of the heavens, and to show you the glory of the heavens, if you fly us, uh, we'll show you these beautiful constellations in their Art Deco style, and it's some humor. Here's the Cetus, the whale, about ready to eat this airplane that's coming around from the side of the globe, uh, and you see a number of beautiful uh, kind of emotionally laden uh, images to get you to fly this carrier. So I'll conclude with that now, just uh, if you want more on pictorials or other things that are in this issue of the Star Maps book, the third edition, and then solar system maps. If you feel that you didn't get enough from the, about the solar system maps, uh, there's a book written there here as well, and you can check them out on the website. So I'll conclude and take your questions. Nick, thank you very much. That was an amazing talk. Uh, learned so much in just uh, the 40, 50 minutes or so. I have uh, several questions from the audience. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead uh, with the first one and then uh, we'll keep going. So uh, first uh, question is from Jim Stauffer and he asks, when and where did the concept of tropic lines originate? Uh, it originated uh, going way back uh, to to the, the the Greek system, they had had visualized the heavens. Uh, the ecliptic was popular, but the idea of projecting the globes in the sphere was also a very popular issue. A popular textbook in the Middle Ages was the Sphera, the Sphera, and th in this textbook, it actually talked about expanding out the the Earth into the celestial sphere and kind of uniting the Earth's celestial sphere with the Earth's uh, terrestrial. Uh, sphere. So it goes way back into the Greek period of time. Thanks, Nick. Uh, this uh, next question is from Tracy, Tracy Winkler. 
Where in California is the best place to view the most stars with the naked eye? Well, uh, there are many good places. You can go down to uh, some of the observatory sites. Palomar Observatory site is getting a little bit air polluted, but if you go down there and you go east where the air is dry, uh, you will see stars. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, I'm in a club and we go up to Mount Tamalpais, but it's not the best. Fiddletown, north of here, is a, is a, it's got a nice combination of dry air and dark skies. So you want to get high where the atmosphere, high in the mountain, where the atmosphere is, a, is not swirling around so much and away from light pollution. Uh, so find your local mountain that's away f- as best you can from the pollution areas, and that's where you can see the sky the best. Away from the oceans, the, uh, the ocean air is also kind of damp, and it, it kind of interferes with observing. Mm-hmm. I, I looked into Mount Palomar area, of course, now it's closed. Yeah. Um, but uh, when it opens up, I, I definitely want to attend. Uh, Tracy has another question. Are any constellations mentioned in the Old Testament of the Bible? Uh, that I don't know. I, I'm not, I don't know about that. I know that um, the, the constellations were mentioned by the Sumerians, and you had the you know, Taurus, for example, on some of the plates, uh, the clay plates, you find uh, references to that. Uh, so it, it, it goes back quite a bit. Homer talked about uh, some constellations as well in his writings. I just don't know about the Bible. Uh, I know Shakespeare did. Um, so the Bible, I, I just I don't have a handle on that one. Thanks, Nick. Um, next question. Can you comment on the Mayans' depiction of the sky? Uh, they were unique in not being influenced by the Chinese, Indians, Egyptians, or Greeks. Yeah, the, the Mayan sky, the Mayans were really more interested in Venus. And the Mayan cosmology uh, had a lot to do with the planets, especially Venus, which they saw as, uh, as two, two stars, the morning star and the, and the night star. And so on their stele, uh, the Aztecs and then the Mayans both were very much into, into the location of Venus, had a lot of symbolism in telling time and in terms of their observations. They weren't as, as interested in the constellation images as some of the other groups were. Okay. Um, in reference to the question about the Bible, a couple of attendees have said, uh, hi, Charlotte. Uh, she says, uh, believe Orion is in the book of Job. And then uh, Paul, yeah, and then Paul, Paul Davis says, Book of Job refers to Pleiades and some constellations. So there you have it. Yeah. Um, next question is, what is, was it serendipity that Ptolemy's work survived for Europeans to build upon its contents? Um, probably. There were uh, a lot of the, 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 a lot of the books from the ancient Greeks were preserved in the original Greek in Byzantium. And when Constantinople fell, some of those uh, libraries that had the original Greek consul, Greek writings, not just Ptolemy, but others, including Ptolemy, by the way, uh, came across uh, and were stored in Venice. So that's why Venice has a lot of Byzantine influences and some of the great library were preserved and were saved. In the uh, Islamic culture is the same way. They got uh, a hold of several of these famous books and, and translated them into Arabic. And so they preserved them in their ser- settings. And so when uh, the uh, uh, areas like Southern Spain were taken over by the Europeans again, they would manage to retrieve these Arabic and uh, books that were serendipity uh, in a sense, uh, but famous at the time. They were saved because they were famous and important, but who knows what famous and important book wasn't saved and we don't know about. Great. Uh, thanks, Nick. So uh, next question is from Jerry, J- Jerry Rosenthal, and he asks, uh, to what extent did different cultures make similar groupings of stars into constellations, even though each assigned different character characters to its constellations. So he says, for example, how many cultures saw the stars of our Big Dipper as a constellation? Oh, I don't know how many, but it, the Big Dipper was a common one. The Pleiades was very common. The, the more obvious an asterism is, 
uh, more than the constellation. The asterism is a part of a constellation that's especially prominent. And so many cultures had the Big Dipper, and I mentioned a couple, but the Pleiades was very popular. Even the Aborigines had the Pleiades, uh, the Seven Sisters, and they had a mythology related around uh, that as well. So there were some like the Pleiades, Star Cluster and Taurus, and then the, the Big Dipper that were found in many cultures. I, I can't tell you how many, but they're fairly common. Uh, there were something in many, many cultures. The Big Dipper, by the way, also an Indian uh, Native American culture is, uh, was also seen. And in fact, one group, I believe, also saw it as a bear, which is interesting. Uh, thanks, Nick. Uh, so Amy Cody asks, uh, she says, uh, fascinating game, beautiful maps. Uh, what book or resource would you recommend for novice, star, slash uh, constellation gazers? Uh, thank you. Uh, to, for observing the concept? Yeah, yeah. so book a resource uh, that you might recommend for novice. Okay, what I would do, what I tell people who are, want to be, who are amateurs, who want to be amateurs, is um, get either astronomy magazine or sky and telescope magazine. These come out monthly. Uh, astronomy is a little more for the novice, I guess, than sky and telescope, but they both include sections every month of which stars are up uh, and what to see and how to see them. And they have star maps as well. And I think that, um, that the, the, those two magazines are current and you can find them on the newsstands. Uh, I would recommend either of those as a good way to start if you're an observer. Uh, thanks, Nick. Uh, Shaquille Imtiaz asks, um, Despite a detailed analysis of multiple cultural delineations of the stars, uh, be it Indian, Islamic, or Egyptian, what actually resulted in the predominant acceptance of the Greek system? Uh, Alexander um, the Great. Alexander the Great, Alexander the Great. When he went through Asia all the way to India, uh, he left pockets of knowledge along the way that reflected Greek culture. And that was a very important uh, determinant of the Greek constellation system becoming uh, uh, taken over by all the cultures in the Near East into India. China was pretty far away. What in, influ influenced Chinese uh, accepting the Western were the Jesuits. When the Jesuits went over later, uh, than Alexander the Great, I think 15, 1600s, um, they brought to the Chinese uh, emperor, uh, they did a lot of trading, you know, they brought clocks and other things. And so they did a lot of swapping of not only things, but ideas. And so the Jesuits were very responsible for having um, a Chinese constellation system become more uh, influenced by the Greek system. And then as China went, many of the other uh, Asian, Korea and Japan were also influenced as well. Thanks, Nick. Uh, Jane Morgan asks, uh, she's talking about eclipse predictions. Uh, what do you think about Mark Twain's knowledge in Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's court? No, don't know, I don't know yeah. what that, I can't, I'm not sure what she's referring to on that. His knowledge in Connecticut Yankee about eclipses yeah, well, yeah, it is a little bit cryptic. Jane, if you don't mind asking the question again, or even just put it in the chat, uh, I'll be happy to get back to it uh, after some other questions. Uh, Nick, our next question is from Graham Snyder. Um, as I understand it, Islamic star maps from the 9th and 10th centuries were grouped by clusters, not constellations. What was the origin, origin of this? Um, uh, to my knowledge, the, the Islamic groupings were, were influenced heavily by the Greeks because they took the Greek system in the ninth century and translated everything from Greek into, into Arabic. And so I believe they were still using that Greek system. I don't know of any other clustering that they did. Uh, I'd be interested if, if, if maybe you could enlighten me on that, uh, if there's more than that. I know the Chinese had clustering. The Chinese were not influenced so much until the Jesuits came. So original Chinese, they had groupings of clusters uh, uh, 
in, in their cosmology. But uh, the Islamic, I thought, were still pretty much taken over by the Greeks. Thanks, Nick. Uh, Lawrence Bay asks, uh, it was interesting to see human figures in the Islamic star maps. Were human figures in astronomy somehow exempt from the general prohibition? I think in, in that grouping, no. I, I would say no. I'm not 100% sure. But I know that the the um, you can have a trail. Maybe they were temporarily during that kind of classic time. But but you can have a trail from the, the some of the, for example, the one I showed had some Bedouin influences, the two fish that came across. So there were some influences that were local. But they took the Greek system and they kind of carried it through so I can trace uh, images of animals and people throughout the, among the scholars who studied the Greek system. What I don't know is whether it may be in certain religious contexts they were forbidden, but it very well might be that they're, they're, they were. But to my knowledge, academically, they were pretty much followed through even into the Ottoman period. Thanks, Nick. Andre uh, Dennis asks, um, in the 90s, 1980 map, 1980s map you showed, is the latitude and longitude determined from a geocentric view? Uh, what is the most typical for current day celestial maps? The 90, okay. One of the things I, I didn't mention, but I could mention, on the Flamsteed, going with Flamsteed, you'll notice from then on, you'll notice instead of having degrees, uh, you have hours, one to 24 hours. And the reason for that is if you're observing, if you're depending on the Earth's rotation to bring the stars into your view and you set your telescope and you, you have a plan for your latitude so it's tilted, in one hour you'll see a cluster of stars, the second hour you'll see another cluster. So it became the tradition to look at uh, degrees of, uh, of, um, of um, longitude in terms of hours, not degrees. Uh, so the, the, the ecliptic system looks at celestial latitude and longitude. The, the system with the equatorial from the telescope here and to the modern day astronomy, you'll see the hours on the, on the uh, longitude and what's called right ascension up and down. So up and down from the equatorial is called right ascension, but it's still in degrees zero to 90 degrees to the North Pole and zero minus 90 degrees in the South Pole. But the longitude going around the equatorial line in the heavens is in terms of hours, one, two, three, four, five, and subdivide in terms of minutes. So that's what you, why you see on Flamsteed's charts and later charts, uh, hour symbols, not degree symbols. Thanks, Nick. Uh, Sarah Sterling asks, uh, following up on best places to see stars, um, uh, so is it better to see them from a hill, uh, like from, uh, from the hill housing uh, uh, at the Lick Observatory, or, or rather than from a flat uh, desert location? Well, you want to have a dry area that's on a hill, if you can find that combination. Um, I know that... Uh, the higher up, that's why the, some of the great telescopes are built high up where the air is, is less turbulent and it's thinner. You don't have as much air swirling above you. And that's why it's not so good by, the, by an ocean. Um, so Lick Observatory is on a hill uh, in Northern California. It's on a hill and it's inland a bit. So it's relatively dry and high up. Uh, a good place to go, I know that every year there's a big star party of many astronomical amateur groups at Fremont Peak, uh, and Fremont Peak is located near Hollister. Uh, and so that's another good location because you're kind of inland enough, so you're not influenced by the, the air of the uh, ocean, but you're also on a peak, so it's higher up, and it's relatively dark sky, so that's another good place to go. Yeah, one of the um, other attendees mentioned uh, uh, that Pinnacles is good. I, I think she meant uh, Pinnacles National Park. So just wanted to add yeah. that. And the nice thing about a desert is you might have a little more swirling of air, but you have nice horizons, although you have a good horizons on top of the mountain too. So you want to be in a place 
the drier, the better, the higher, the better. But sometimes you take compromises. If you can go into a desert and it's dark, really dark, that's a good, a good sign, even though you're on a flat desert, although some of the deserts are a little bit elevated too. Thanks, Nick. Uh, Jen asks, what is the most creative celestial map you've ever seen? The most what? The most creative celestial map. Just a fun question. Creative. Uh, the ones I showed. Uh, well, there's an interesting Aboriginal map that I didn't show uh, because I, I had to limit it somewhere. That it shows the the um, the uh, solar system, the uh, Pleiades uh, mythology, uh, and so that's kind of a fun one to do it from a kind of a cultural viewpoint. I think my favorite maps of the ones I showed uh, is the, the uh, probably the Solarius map is the most beautiful one uh, because it's, it adds a lot of artistic features to uh, a, basically a sound map. I mean, Solarius was sound in his placement, but you have all these pooty and all these diagrams and it's just beautiful. And so I think the way that the integrated art into the utility of the map and and the discussion of the text in Solarius's Atlas is a nice way of doing it. Uh, so I, I like the Solarius maps. I have a couple that I afforded because early on they were cheaper than they are now, uh, but they, they really are beautiful if you wanna look them up online and get a good handle of them. Uh, uh, thanks, Nick. So uh, Paul Davis asks, did Africa um, other than Egypt uh, co contribute any constellations? They had constellation systems, and uh, in the um, in the um, uh, the solar solar system maps, uh, my, my second book, I have a, a bigger representation of cultural issues than in star maps. Star maps focus on influences to the Greek system, uh, but in solar system maps, I talk more about it. And there were some some African tribes that they had their own constellation system, and some of that is mentioned, uh, especially the uh, Aborigine and, and some of the, um, the uh, cosmography of the Mayans and so on is in more in detail there. But yes, Africa was also involved. Everybody had constellations of, of a kind. Uh, very good. Um, I, I think um, uh, I also just wanted to add uh, a sort of a related question in terms of the, uh, how constellations are looked at, uh, looked at by different cultures and sort of reflects the culture that are in. I think one of your slides had uh, um, this Vedic uh, time and, uh, and you refer to that as Indian. Um, I, 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 would, I would just comment to say that's, that, that, that is more Hindu than Indian. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Yeah, better, better, better use of words. Um, Sue Blumenberg asks, where can we learn more about Aboriginal constellations? Just talked about that. Um, well, think. again, I cover that in, in um, well, actually in the third edition of Star Maps, I have the one particular one I was mentioning. I have, a, in, in, I have two new chapters in Star Maps. One is on pictorial maps and the other one is on celestial images and art. And that was a fun chapter for me to write because uh, up till now, I've been talking about star maps themselves as being artistic. Well, there's celestial images also in art. And I cover a little bit about some of the Aborigine um, mythology in, in, in the use of, of an art form, uh, the one that I mentioned earlier. So either of the, of the books I have uh, will touch on the Aborigine art as well. The Aborigines had a very, very, uh, the Aborigine and, and especially the, um, also, and also the uh, Pacific Island cultures had a very active uh, astronomical uh, system that was really oriented towards their cultures. And it's, in, in fact, the New Zealand and some of the Pacific Island is especially rich in, um, or in, in um, uh, nautical lore. Uh, I mean, the biggest constellation uh, of, of the in New Zealand lore is a big canoe. And it goes right across the sky. It takes up several of our constellations. And it's a great, con because what was important to, to these seafaring peoples were canoes and boats and, and navigation. And so their lore has a lot of images related to, um, to uh, uh, the sea, boats, things like that. 
the Aborigines were more based on land. So theirs reflects local mythologies and local, the dreaming state and some of the uh, imagery related to the dreaming stage of a basically an inland culture. Right, right. I, I'm thinking about, um, when I think about uh, the Polynesians, I mean, they yeah. their, and their relationship with uh, stars and how they use stars basically to navigate the waters, uh, that sort of thing. So that's great. Um, Sasan Hizagi um, asks, uh, how did the Greek estimate celestial distances, particularly the distance of the planets from the earth, including the distance of the sun in comparison to the other planets? Well, they, they, they were able to do that. There were a couple of Greek astronomers that could, that could do that relatively speaking. For example, uh, one of the things that they did is they, uh, uh, they could measure the shadow uh, of two different points. And they knew the roughly the circumference of the earth. And then they could measure the shadow between two, two points in the sky, uh, two points on earth. Uh, and, and the degree of the difference of the shadows using the uh, nomen straight up and down would tell you what percent uh, in, of 360 degrees that the two, two cities uh, were representing uh, from each other. And they knew that distance in stadies, they call them basically a unit of measurement. And so through trigonometry, you have an angle, the angular distance in the sky and the distance that it represented, you could create a triangle and see the distance, the relative distance anyway, uh, to the earth or say the distance of the moon. So they could do that because they're the genius of the Greek, uh, ancient Greeks was in, in astronomy was the mathematical astronomy. Uh, interestingly enough, the, um, the philosophers were the ones that were supposed to, to talk about the, the universe cosmology. The mathematicians were the ones that were supposed to, to talk about the position of the stars in the heavens. And so they were more interested not in what made sense realistically, but predicting where things are going to be located at different times of the year. So they were very good at spherical uh, geometry and trigonometry, and they could tell a lot of things like relative distances of things. Thanks, Nick. Um, Robert Nielsen asks, did the Australian Aboriginals attach any importance to the Southern Cross? They had a constellation that included the Southern Cross. I, I can't remember if it's the, the canoe or not, but the Southern Cross was especially important. So they had it, they recognized it because it's an obvious asterism. And they had a, I forget what it was, if it was a kangaroo or I forget the exact what it represented, but they had something. The Southern Cross was especially important though to mariners from the European side who went down into the South because it was one of the important asterisms. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't due exactly due South, but it was certainly important enough where they knew they're in the Southern Hemisphere and they couldn't see it anywhere from the North. So it was included, but I think the, the, um, for a different reason, the uh, European uh, uh, people that, that went down south saw a lot of importance to it because of their uh, maritime feature. Mm. Uh, we, we talked about this a little bit already. Uh, Pacific Islanders navigated using the stars. We talked about that. Uh, did they have the, uh, these, their maps um, do they, did they have maps or they were these committed to memory? Uh, both. I think they had a lot of a, a lot of knowledge of the stars and of the positions. But there's I remember seeing a wonderful map that was done uh, of currents, ocean currents. They were so good that they could actually give a sense of the flow of the currents. And these were done out of some kind of straw or I forget the, the exact plan it was but they were good at interpreting the, the patterns in the ocean as well. Now, remember, they didn't go really far away from land. I mean, they would go island hopping, um, but they did use a star for memory and they did use maps that were constructed. And the one I can think of right away was one that had the currents and the relative way that the currents flowed uh, in, in one group. Mm, okay. Uh, Lisa O'Reilly asks, are there any interesting or beautiful digital con digital constellation maps that you can recommend 
do you know of any immersive or, or interactive AR or VR um, maps that build on the artistic and cultural history of these maps? Say, say that again, the last one. I, I missed yeah, it. so uh, she's asking if, uh, if there are any AR or VR maps, you know, with the Oculus Rift, being able to immerse yourself. Uh, and she's saying, uh, do these, is there anything there that has built um, on the artistic and cultural history uh, of these maps? Uh, so, so this is added knowledge on top of the layer, map layers, maybe in an immersive environment uh, using, a, using either a HoloLens or a Oculus Rift. Yeah, that I, I don't quite understand that question, but I, I don't. So I, I'm not. I don't think I can answer that question. Um, there are a number. I'm. I'm just trying to look in in my my books. I don't remember offhand, but there are a lot of things you can go on iPhones, and you and you and you can get them. Uh, if, if she wants to, um, I'll look up a couple uh, and and can recommend them. I don't I can't think of them offhand. Um, maybe somebody out there knows, but you can get. I think there's one called Star Maps. In fact. But there are several digital uh, features where you can use them for your iPhone. And uh, here we go, Star Walk, someone is recommending. My phone, yes. Okay. But there are there are many of them. Cosmic Watch. Yeah, we have uh, in in the uh, the group here. I'm I'm sure there are people that have experimented with some of these. Uh, very good. So we're back to that uh, Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court question. Uh, it says, just to explain the question from Jane, I seem to remember in the Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court, the main character, who was a time traveler, uh, uses his, his recollection of when an eclipse occurred to present himself as a wizard or something like yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, yeah, I remember vaguely something, something about that. I mean, eclipse... The Mesopotamians could tell eclipses. I mean, they, they, they didn't use... Um, geometry like the Greeks did, but the Mesopotamians had huge records. I mean, going across centuries and they could predict a lot of things, uh, solar and lunar eclipses because they could kind of follow the pattern uh, of time. So that e eclipse prediction was not unknown to the ancients. Right, right. Uh, J.B. Panter asks, uh, what are the some best some of the best celestial atlases to check out within the Ramsey map collection? Uh, any favorites? Um, I can just quickly tell you that uh, one of the things we will do for all the people who registered uh, when we when we um, send out a follow up email, uh, we're going to uh, make sure to point to some so everybody will get that. But uh, Nick, if you have a favorite, go right ahead. But I'm going to make sure to answer that question. In well. Um, I'm kind of a big, I'm kind of a, a big Hevelius fan. Uh, Hevelius, I was able to get a couple of star maps from Hevelius' atlas. They're very rare. And uh, Hevelius, even though he's kind of old fashioned and kind of funky, I think it's just beautifully done. And I like the Hevelius atlas. Um, I think the, nowadays the atlases like the Will Tyrion, if you want a contemporary atlas, uh, there's a, Will Tyrion has generated a couple of atlases that people still use today, amateurs still use, and those you can find uh, if you want to get the 1980, the one I showed, for example, um, you can get that on eBay if you, if you want, and, and they're collectible, I mean, you can get them for a modest 40 bucks, 50 bucks, so there, there are some contemporary ones you can get. The atlases of Hevelius and Flamsteed and so on uh, I can't afford. I mean, there are tens of thousands of dollars for those atlases uh, up to Solaris Atlas is probably over a hundred thousand. So you're not going to be able to buy those, but you can get replicas. And if you check eBay, uh, you can find um, uh, some of the replicas that might be of, of both the prints and even atlases. Uh, I know that there's a, the, um, um, the, the, the uh, atlas of, uh, Flamsteed, I think I'm trying to remember. Fortin, I mean, Fortin's, you can buy a Fortin Atlas for $3,000, $4,000 online if you're interested in having that, if you got money to, to, to pay for that. So they're available, but the real classical ones, you have to, you're kind of dependent on just looking into the, uh, into the internet. I'm just checking in my book here. So I have a couple things um, uh, for 
iPhones, the the uh, the DSS browser is, has a database. Uh, Solar Walk is one you can get uh, for a, a, an iPhone. There, so there are a number of of, of, of star uh, finders that you can use for the iPhone. Great, thanks, Nick. Um, Mark Thompson asks: In early maps, the the Honeybee constellation was named and represented in the Southern Hemisphere. In later maps, the image was removed. Of uh, which one was it? In in later maps, the image was removed. Of of which constellation? Uh, of the Honeybee constellation. Okay. So so I'll just repeat the whole thing. In yeah. in early maps, the Honeybee constellation was named and represented in the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah. In later maps, the image was removed. Uh, so he asked, who determines the removal of these yeah. representations? You know. The honeybee became a fly, and then there was a northern fly and a southern fly, and it came and went. I, in the star map book, I've tracked a lot of these obsolete constellations and some of their history. Uh, I, I'll just so the short answer is the original Greek constellations were in the lore for a long time, and 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 some of the southern constellations were became quite they were done by Europeans anyway became in the lore as well. Nicholas Lacai, for example, when he went to the Southern Hemisphere and came back with his constellations, he presented to the French Academy of Sciences and it was a big deal. And so a lot of those constellations still exist. But others were very uh, kind of odd. I have a, a section in my, in my book on obsolete constellations. And who determines it? Uh, in the old days, the wild and woolly old days, it's whoever did the atlas could add or subtract anything he wanted or she wanted. Most of them done by men, uh, but uh, you know they were basically the eye of the beholder and who did the atlas. But when the um, Astronomical Congress, the international group met, they determined by decree which constellations were the final 88 that were the winners. And everybody follows that from now on. So that was not a unique person like Bode who wanted to maybe gets extra money from the Frederick the Great. Um, it was basically an international body in the 1922 decided this is it. That's the constellation that's going forward that mean anything. So that was by a, 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 an agreement. And that's kind of the where we are now. Mm. Okay. Um, I just want to mention uh, to everybody that's watching, um, uh, we still have several questions. So what I'm gonna do is uh, start, start to um, ask questions and get uh, from folks who have uh, not uh, had a chance to get their question answered. I'll, I'll work with those and uh, we'll go from there. Um, so uh, Rene Anderson asks- Wait, One second, someone's yes. mentioning Jameson's Atlas and I agree with that. That's one that you can buy online and check it out on eBay or uh, and that's one that's really nicely done, uh, 1800s, but it's really beautifully done. It's English. Uh, and that's one that you can, one can afford. And this looks like it's also available digitally. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's also digital. Yeah. Um, Rene Anderson asks, why were animals, people, and other images used on the maps? Um, it had to do with the mythology and a lot of the constellations, for example, now the zodiac has animal imagery, probably reflecting because it came from the east and, and, and for, there the animal imagery was very important. Uh, you'll find on clay tablets from Mesopotamia, for example, a lot of animal Taurus and the bull and so on. But in the Greek constellation, some of the additional ones were not animals or they were gods. And you have Andromeda is up there, Hercules is up there. So you'll find uh, not only animals, but humans, but generally people wrapped up with the mythology. So the mythology of, of a culture, like again, getting back to the Aborigines with a dreaming state, a lot of stuff reflects a dreaming state. Whatever is important philosophically or religiously that was thrown up to the heavens had to do a lot with the mythology of that culture. And they did them to teach young people, to explain its morals, uh, ethical issues were up there. So you find a lot of the constellations of, of them, uh, especially the ones involving gods and goddesses were related to teaching uh, a story of some kind. Okay. Um, 
Alan Agrawal asks, would you, if you could own one historic celestial globe, which one and why? That you can buy? Own, yeah, he's, he's asking, yeah, own. Uh, celestial globes are very expensive and I, I have not gotten into celestial globes because I could, I could buy a lot of prints and even atlases for the price of one globe. Um, so the, I, I think it depends on what you want. If you, you can probably buy a Rand McNally globe that's a celestial in the early 1900s for several hundred dollars. And if you want to have a globe, I have one like that. And I, what it's made on Bakelite, you know, Bakelite, the old plastic. Uh, and that's what I could afford. And I bought it. It's, it's very nice. But uh, if you want to buy one that's, that's um, really old, uh, there was done in England, for example, uh, with constellations. They're very, very thousands of dollars. And some of the classical ones that were done are, you know, you, you, we can't afford them. So it's hard to answer that if you buy one, I would say you want one that's affordable. The more recent you can find, the more likely it is to be affordable. So long as it, if you want one without constellations, they're even more affordable. The ones that have nice constellation images uh, done in the 1920s, like this one I have, uh, still had some constellations on it. It was not terribly expensive. Uh, thank you, Nick. I think. Uh... Uh, what I'm going to do, there's about four or five more questions. Um, so we'll just keep going uh, till we're done with them. Um, uh, Lisa O'Reilly asks, do you know of any modern slash contemporary attempts to assign new culturally inclusive characters or storylines to the traditional constellations? No, I, again, I think it has to do with the fact that the... Um, the constellations were locked in place in 1922. And uh, any attempt to change that, I think, would be futile because these are the official constellation groupings. Um, the, the, the attempt to Christianize the heavens, you would think would have been successful. I mean, it was done in the middle of the, the year of the Catholic Church is very powerful and, and it, it, it got rid of all the pagan symbolism. It just didn't connect. People did not connect with the Christianized heavens, even though you would think they would. So there have been attempts to do that, and they've all failed. Currently, I don't see that happening because the constellations, first of all, the images are, are, are not so important, but they, by decree, everybody follows these constellations all over the world. So I don't see, I mean, you can do it, you can do it as kind of a funky thing to do uh, and create your own constellations, but I don't think it'll take off. Uh, because of the international uh, agreement. Thanks, Nick. Uh, Ra Rashida Doctor asks, uh, are there modern maps that have a lot of artistry but include our current knowledge of the sky? They have a lot of art history. No, uh, artistry, or artist tree, not art history, but art history. Oh. oh, I think, I think the pictorials. Uh, I think the pictorials are kind of unto themselves, they have gotten, to be, I didn't show you, uh, I, uh, I mean, I, I have a whole bunch of examples uh, on my wall over here, but I, I which you can't see because the wall I'm showing, uh, by the way, I'm not in, I'm not in the basement. Uh, somebody asked a question, I'm in my den and I've got things on the wall, but, uh, but the, in the Star Maps book, uh, the new one, the third edition, there's a whole chapter on, on, on artistry, but I, I would say the pic, and on pictorials, I would say the pictorials are the latest equivalent of beautiful imaged star maps that we have. And some of them are, again, very affordable. Uh, if you go to dealers and you can look up a number of dealers uh, online and uh, I have a listing of them in the, in the appendix of my book. I don't like to, I don't like to plug dealers, but um, one example, there's several dealers in uh, New York and London, the hotbeds of celestial mapping, Barry Rutterman, uh, Rare Maps uh, is a member of the California Can uh, the Map Society, and I know has been involved with your group. Uh, he's a dealer, and you can just check out his website. He's got a number of and pictorial maps uh, are unto themselves. You can go on eBay and look up pictorial maps, and you'll find some there. Uh, they're nice because they're affordable. They're 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 interesting because they want to show something, but they they're fairly modern 
in the 1900s and they're collectible and they do show constellations. And if you like Art Deco, you'll find a lot of great Art Deco representations. I, I also want to add that uh, uh, the Dave Ramsey map collection uh, has about 4,000 pictorials. Several of them are you know, of the, of the heavens and, and, and so forth. The, uh, one of them, I think you showed the Air France, uh, the, the flights and so forth. So we, we have many of them online. Uh, we also have many at uh, just the catalog, all, all scanned and I mean the Stanford catalog. Uh, uh, search works. Um, so yeah. there's, there's lots of them. Yeah, I, I, you're absolutely right. I, and I know that some of the uh, maps in my books, uh, I've uh, been able to obtain courtesy of David Rumsey. He's been very generous in his, you know, allowing me to pretty much reproduce a lot of what he's got for my books. Uh, and so the David Rumsey online is wonderful. Your center is wonderful. I think that uh, uh, you'll find a lot of the uh, maps that are that are present. Uh, online are located both at Stanford and in the separate website for David Rumsey. So those are great places to look. Um, Leslie asks, uh, I think many times you refer uh, uh, of, you know, refer to the Aborigines. Uh, or, uh, do you mean Australian Aborigines or are there others? Oh, I, I, I mean Australian Aborigines. I, I, I guess the word small a could be something else. Right. Yeah, I'm just talking about the Australian. They had a very rich culture. And I mentioned some of the, the images of, for example, the seven sisters were seven, uh, seven um, uh, women that came down from the heavens. They met seven men and there's a whole culture. Uh, there's a whole mythology around. They met seven warriors on the ground and, and they, they connected and they, they danced and had parties. And then at the end of the day, it's time to go back. Six of the sisters took off and one of the sisters didn't want to go and leave her lover. And it was getting to be daylight and she had to go. So she finally went. So if you look at the Pleiades, you'll find six stars, actually mainly six now, it's the seven sisters. But if you have really good eyes, you can make out another one. But one of the stars is lagging behind. And the, the mythology reflects that by saying that's the, the, the recalcitrant sister who couldn't leave her lover and got a late start to go back to the heavens. It's a beautiful little mythology. Um, I have a couple more questions left. Um, I guess just curious here. Yeah, we're just... Uh, uh, just being mindful of time, uh, so we couldn't get to all of them because uh, there were folks who uh, asked more than one question. And um, so this is by uh, this question is posed by Jasmine Milliken, and uh, she asks, as an Aquarian, I've always found it interesting that the pictorial version of the constellation Aquarius is sometimes depicted as female and sometimes male. Hmm. Have you observed any patterns throughout, uh, throughout history that speak to us, speak to as to why it may be depicted as one or the other? Well, uh, no, but I think that, again, you can create what you want. And in the pictorial maps, you have a little more latitude because the, the whole idea of pictorial terrestrial and celestial maps is not necessarily to be traditional or accurate, but to have an emotional punch of some kind to convey a message where buy a product or visit an area or just observe something wonderful. Uh, so accuracy in terms of traditional accuracy may not be necessarily displayed as much as the punch you're trying to give. So I would imagine you can change the gender or do a lot with a pictorial map uh, depending on what you're trying to convey emotionally to the viewer. Mm, that's, uh... And that, that makes that makes sense. Um, our, our last question is a really good one um, to end with, I think. Um, and it's a fun one. This is uh, Mike uh, Laherty. He asks, uh, what maps are you collecting right now? The I'm in a phase of life where I'm sort of steady state. Uh, but uh, my my second biggest collection, they reflect the two chapters in the third edition of the book. Pictorials, I, was, I got really into pictorials because I have a, what I consider to be a nice representation. I don't have a lot of maps necessarily of duplicates, but I have a representation of, of the history. I'm, I collect with an eye towards historical trends. And so uh, I got into the pictorials because they were kind of the latest collectible, they're affordable, and I just enjoy them. I need a lot of fun. 
Lately, though, I've gotten into the imagery of um, celestial images in art. And uh, I've been able to buy a number of paintings uh, uh, of local artists uh, in Northern California, especially up towards uh, Santa Rosa area, in that area and, and near Sacramento. A lot of them have migrated there because they can afford to live there more than in San Francisco. But there's a lot of local artists that I've been able to buy uh, uh, originals from, uh, and some have been digital uh, pieces as well. Uh, and so I've been collecting art forms that are not necessarily a map, but are celestial themed. Uh, so that's been kind of my latest collection. So I'd say pictorials and then art forms, affordable art forms. I mean, I'm not going to be able to afford a Van Gogh, Starry Nights, but I can afford some of the others. And again, if you check out my the, the, the chapter in the book, I have some references of, because I had to get their permissions, of some wonderful local artists in Northern California anyway, uh, that, that are, you can buy the art if you, if you like. Wonderful. Um, Nick, I, um, I, want you, I want to thank you very, very much for, for uh, this wonderful talk and uh, for staying on to answer all the, uh, all the questions we had. Um, there were more, but we just want to be mindful of time as well and people's time, your time. Um, so again, appreciate uh, you coming and uh, talking about your books and your, and your work. Um, uh, again, many, many thanks. And uh, for, for the, the, the lot of you who are here, please uh, see if you could make it to the book talk in, in January, the one um, and uh, that's about time and maps, and uh, we're, we're looking forward to that book launch. Uh, it is, um, uh, it came out of a conference from here, and so we're really, really excited. Um, and uh, I hope to see uh, many of you there. Thank you, everyone. Take Thank care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.